All right, Alexander, let's talk about uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin's speech at uh, the World Economic Forum. Davos in attendance, I'm certain, was uh, Mr. Klaus Schwab, the architect of the Great Reset. And uh, it's been 12 years since Vladimir Putin has given a, a speech at Davos, and I think he really wanted to, uh, to speak this year, given everything that has happened in 2019, 2020. And I thought it was, a, it was an excellent speech, and I thought it was very much a speech that, uh, that Putin wanted to give because I think he wanted to, to send a warning to the world. And uh, specifically, I think he was speaking, obviously, to Europe, but also to the United States. And he was talking a lot about uh, big tech, uh, tech monopolies, free speech, arms control, avoiding uh, a catastrophic nuclear conflict. I mean, he was talking about all these things. And I, I think at, at the end of the uh, wrapping it all up, let me, put it, let me put it that way, wrapping it all up. I think Putin's message specifically to the American people was that uh, you guys need to be very careful because all signs are, are showing that uh, your country is heading towards the, uh, the co communist, Marxist, totalitarian abyss. That's how I, that's how I read his speech. What did, what did you make of uh, Putin's speech at Davos? It was a fascinating speech, by far the most thoughtful and interesting speech that anybody has given at Davos, not just at this particular uh, meeting in Davos, but in fact in any meeting that I can remember for a very, very long time. Um, can I say Klaus Schwab was not only there, he actually introduced Putin, commented at the end of the speech and thanked Putin at the end of the speech also. So uh, he would have been listening very, very carefully because what the speech is actually, if you unpack it and read it through closely, is a withering uh, demolition or deconstruction of the whole fourth industrial revolution, globalist world order that we have been seeing. I mean, as always, Putin speaks in extremely polite and measured terms. But when you actually deconstruct it, that is exactly what he is saying. And what he says, he says some very interesting things. He says that globalization has benefited the very few, not the many. He talks about the, the way uh, uh, um, ideas have become vulgar and dogmatic since the 1980s. He criticizes the Washington consensus. He says, yes, it's absolutely true that there's been a significant rise in living standards around the world over the last um, um, 40 years. But this has come in a greatly unbalanced way and perhaps only a million people altogether are gaining a disproportionate share of um, the new wealth that has been generated. He talks about how the existing economic model is failing and how um, attempts to revive the problems, or, or reduce the problems that have been arising through um, uh, stimulus packages. He's talking essentially about QE and those kind of things that that's increasingly failing and is becoming counterproductive. And he's also talks about and he says, I mean, things like, you know, that, that um, things like this, he says that the past 20, 20 years, we have created a foundation for the so-called fourth industrial revolution based on the wide use of AI and automation and robotics. However, this process is leading to new structural changes. I am thinking in particular of the labour market. This means that very many people could lose their jobs unless the state, note the state, in other words, sovereign states, takes effective measures to prevent this. Most of these people are from the so-called middle class, which is the basis of any modern society. So essentially, he is standing up as the defender of the middle class, as the defender of the working class, as the defender of states. He talks about states being absolutely essential to preserve peace. He talks about how states cooperate with each other and how that is good, but how unipolar attempts to control things are impossible. And of course, he has a lot to say about the tech companies. And um, I'm just going to 
read out what he says about that because it's become such a topical issue. Modern technological giants, especially digital, digital companies, have started playing an increasing role in life of society. Much has been said about this now, especially regarding the events that took place during the election campaign in the United States. They are not just some economic giants. In some areas, they are de facto competing with states. Their audiences consist of billions of users that pass a considerable part of their lives in these ecosystems. In the opinion of these companies, their monopoly, notice he talks about monopoly, is optimal for organizing technological and business processes. Maybe so, but society is wondering whether such monopolism meets public interests. Where is the, the border between successful global business in demand services and big data consolidation and the attempts to manage society at one's own discretion and in a tough manner replace legal democratic institutions and essentially usurp or restrict the natural right of people to decide for themselves how to live, what to choose and what position to express freely. So we see Putin attacking the whole concept of globalization, uh, criticize the whole idea of the fourth industrial uh, uh, revolution, uh, criticize the whole concept behind QE and all these new monetary models, saying they don't work, uh, uh, talk concernedly about growing inequality and say that the tech companies are ultimately acting in a manner that is incompatible with democracy and with the rule of law as it has been understood. I can say without any hesitation that many of the people in Davos will have been very far from pleased by what they heard. Yeah, I agree with you. He was uh, speaking directly to Klaus Schwab as well. Um, we're going to get into that. I, I want to touch upon what Macron said because it was the exact opposite of what Putin said. But uh, before we get to Macron, uh, a couple of things, two questions. It's been, uh, I've read many reports actually out of Russia that say that Russians, the Russian public and the Russian government, though they're still exploring it, they're dead set against any type of uh, of. Uh, CV passport, we'll call it that, a type of passport in order to, to move around, whether internally or whether traveling. This is what I've read, and but they're still exploring it, they said, but they said that they've examined how the public feels about this, and they've also said that they feel it would be um, an infringement on people's human rights. So that's um, that's the first thing that, uh, that uh, I would like you to address. And another issue that I would like you to address is the Western mainstream media has uh, criticized Putin's speech because he did not mention the protests, the Navalny protests. What do you make of that? Well, the first thing to say about this, about the, about the passports, the CV passports, is as I understand it, Putin himself has spoken out strongly against the whole idea. It's not popular with the Russian public. It's not popular with the Russian government. The Russian government senses that there would be massive opposition to it. And given Russian history, given uh, the experiences the Soviet Union had, bear in mind that in the Soviet Union, people did have special passports. There were special passports that people had to travel internally and there were special passports they needed to apply for and get in order to travel abroad. So there were all these restrictions and controls on people through this various varied system. And the absolute thing they do not want to see is anything like that brought back again. So I think that there would be huge opposition in Russia to doing anything like this. And uh, so I, I don't personally think it's going to happen. And I'm going to say also that for what it's worth, the evidence shows that in Russia, the case count is falling rapidly. I mean, it's uh, fallen by about a, th a third to 40 percent since January. Now, you can take that as true or not as you wish, but that's what the figures show. 
Now, on the question of the, the fact that the media hasn't, you know, focused on the, the Western media has focused on the fact that Putin didn't mention Navalny and the protests in Russia. Well, first of all, this is hardly the venue for that kind of thing. And I mean, this isn't what his speech was about. His speech was not a political speech about current affairs. It was an attempt to discuss the underlying processes in society, which, as I said, he did very effectively. But beyond that, um, I mean, it's again a further attempt by the media in the West to draw attention away from the actual substance of what Putin was saying. I don't want to talk about the various things that Putin talked about, about the fact that there's growing inequality, about the fact that stimulus packages don't work, about the fact that QE is bad, about the enormous pressure on the middle classes and on the working people, about the problems of young people, about the overweening power of monopolies. They want to keep the focus on what Navalny and his supporters are doing, even though, as I discussed, as we've discussed, in various programmes, he doesn't actually have much support. And when you unpack the figures, and I, by the way, now had a, a contact with somebody who was an eyewitness actually present at the protest in Moscow, the numbers were small, very small. He thought, by the way, that they were in the low thousands, lower est a lower estimate than some of the others I've read from people who were also sceptical about the size of the protests. But that's putting all that aside. They want to focus it on Navalny and they want to focus it on those sort of things because they don't want to address the problems that Putin is talking about. And if we're talking about how bizarre and strange things on this topic have become, I noticed an extraordinary article in the Financial Times talking about how Navalny and his supporters have come up with some new great electronic Samizdat. Samizdat was the sort of alternative media um, in, that existed in Russia during the Soviet period. And that they've done this by using uh, um, access to you know, technologies and social media to achieve it. And that this is a you know, wonderful democratizing thing. And this is published in one of the same newspapers, the Financial Times, which has been calling in the West for restrictions on free expression in social media. So you know, they want it to happen in Russia, but they don't want it to happen in their own countries. It's becoming so obvious now that it's becoming impossible to argue around. The fact is, Let's come back to this speech. This is an extraordinarily important and very interesting speech. It absolutely repays reading and it shows, in my opinion, why the globalist establishment sees in Vladimir Putin and in Russia such a challenge. Xi Jinping from China comes along to Davos and he talks the talk, even if he doesn't walk the walk. He speaks about how globalization is wonderful, how we must protect all the things that have been happening, how much we are in favor of all of, you know, fourth industrial revolution and all the rest. He doesn't actually practice that at home, but that's what he says. So they give Xi Jinping a pass. Vladimir Putin comes along and he says in this very polite, very measured but very factual way. I am completely against this. So is my country. This is going to end badly. It is wrong. And we are set, up, set against opposing it. And of course, the globalists are furious. And that's why they loathe him. All right. So let's, uh, let's now go to Macron, because Macron said the exact opposite of... Uh... Of Putin and Macron went full uh, fourth industrial revolution, great reset, woke on everybody. So Macron pretty much says that uh, he pretty much said that modern capitalism, quote, can no longer work. That's a quote, can no longer work. And he also said, we will get out of this pandemic 
only with an economy that thinks more about fighting inequalities. So he went full uh, Great Reset, in, in other words. That's Macron. There's other, everything that has happened in the past 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 years, forget about it. Let's move on now to this new, this new thing. Well, that's exactly right. This is Macron, because, of course, bear in mind something about Macron. Macron is a technocrat. He worked, he was, he worked in finance. He went to all the elite educational institutions that France produces, places like the École Nationale d'Administration. He is absolutely part of this world that believes in and promotes these things. He is not someone who's ever set up a business who's ever been involved in, um, you know, trying to do their own thing, trying to create wealth. He's always managed things. That's the culture that he comes from. It's a technocratic vision of the future, which is, of course, what globalization and the fourth industrialization ultimately is. It's a top down system which tries to impose ideas and policies and views and control thing and control uh, from the top downwards. Putin does not come from that kind of background. I mean, he was obviously he was in, in the intelligence world, but he was also very heavily involved when he was deputy mayor of St. Petersburg in promoting small businesses in St. Petersburg that people don't know about. So he comes from a different perspective and from a society that has essentially repudiated this technocratic vision. It, it has embraced or it sought, sought, or is seeking to embrace a more democratic, capitalistic, if you like, uh, 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 system. So they are absolutely diametrically opposed. And of course, what Putin would say to Macron is when you talk about uh, uh, the purpose of the economy is to um, eliminate inequality, what you're actually doing is you are creating inequality because you are destroying your middle class, you are destroying your working class, you're throwing people out of work, you're crushing their businesses, and the beneficiaries of the system that you're set on creating are going to be very, very few. A small group of people, an oligarchy in control, and everybody else uh, con controlled by them. Putin spoke of basically one million people who would benefit, you know, around the entire work globe, as opposed, in effect, to everyone else. So it, it is a completely different um, outlook. And the other thing about Putin and the thing Putin would, is saying to Macron is what you are proposing isn't going to work in the end because it's cr creating inequalities and imbalances and is ultimately unsustainable and is also extremely dangerous and this is where he talked a lot about arms control and conflicts and set up examples of how states can cooperate with each other to secure peace but the sort of globalist vision of the future works against that. So you have these totally contrasting concepts and visions of the future. And I have to say this, and this is my own personal perspective, Putin's is reality based, grounded on facts, uh, um, is concerned about actual real people. And when he talks about, you know, uh, adherence to law and democracy, of course, there will be many people around the world who will ridicule that coming from Putin. But I think ultimately that is true. I think his, in the end, is the democratic and lawful few, vision of the future against Macron's, which is an anti-democratic, ultimately unlawful vision based on a technocratic concept which is both unworkable and in itself frankly ugly all right we will leave it there alexander mccurse thank you very much guys look for us on bit shoot on odyssey and on rumble 
Also, uh, make sure to check out the Durant shop and pick up some great merch, long sleeves, hoodies, mugs, uh, PayPal, Patreon, subscribe, star, and Bitcoin. Your uh, help really is appreciated for this channel. And uh, what else? Check out Alexander's channel. You'll find the link down below. Check out my channel. You'll find the link down below. And uh, that's it. That's it, indeed. And please join us for our next programme. And we look forward to you, to, to, to you joining us on our other channels and coming to our shop and buying the great things there. And, of course, please look us up on our other platforms, too. All right, Alexander Berkers, thank you very much. Until next time, everybody, take care.